our coming topic of the day, the fireside chat. So please help me welcome again Vivi Himmel and joining her, Sa Samantha Van Leuven from PwC, Head of Hotels and Venues. <clears throat> I met Sam about um, 18 months ago. It was uh, January 2023. Um, Jess and I went to the PwC office then, and it's only been 18 months, but it feels like we've done five years worth of work together, collaboration between Alta Vita and PwC. I have personally admired Sam. She is not only a visionary, but she's also a powerhouse. <laughs> um, and, uh, with Sam, we're going to learn so much about the te technicalities of hotels, service apartments, the benefits, how to design smart, centralized corporate accommodations, and the benefits around it. First question, Sam, is if you can walk us through your career journey and what's driving your vision for corporate accommodation. Okay, um, so I was that child um, that always wanted to work in hotels, actually. Um, I was very lucky to be able... Does that feedback sound really weird, or was it just me? Um, yeah, I wanted to work in hotels when I was very young, so I went to university, Bournemouth University, and this is a bit of, this is a bit of my brain, which is a <laughs> bit random, but I will explain the different areas with it. So I did a hospitality uh, degree at uni and then went to work in London, uh, so I've always had this passion for being in the industry. But one of my other very important passions I got from uh, when I worked, when I was at Bournemouth, was Dirty Dancing was released. I'm obsessed with Dirty Dancing. So I just had to put that, because if you know my personality, you know, Patrick Swayze is my universe. Anyway, when I left um, Bournemouth University, went to work in London, working in the, the hotel industry, and... Uh, Became in my 20s, decided, hmm, wasn't sure that was for me, and applied for a job at Coopers and Librand, uh, which was actually to set up a, to manage a training centre. So at that time, I wasn't aware of who they were, came into it, and it was interesting how lots of people called me poacher to a gamekeeper, because I suddenly went from looking at revenues and ops in hotels into running my own uh, training centre. And then gradually over the years, I've actually continued with the hotels, meetings, and service departments. So service departments is something we adopted a long time ago. Um, so on the left here is a picture of me with women in business. I've got two grown-up children now. Um, mm -hmm. It was hard, actually, as a working mother uh, years ago, because no one understood about working from home. But I survived, and I live to tell the tale today. And my, these are my passion, as in this is... Um, my extended family, so my, my parents' 50th wedding anniversary with um, children and various families. So that's pretty much what drives me, and it, but it's always underpinned by accommodation. So traveling is the other area I, um, I love the most with that. So career-wise, I am where I am now with still pushing forward, still trying to um, improve all the areas I look at. And I think really just gone on to the next slide, I've done a lot of work with meetings and events. And I, I hate this picture, but it's, it proves <laughs> the point. Um, I introduced a payment solution for in the meetings industry. Um, I sit on the GBTA board for accommodation because, again, it's about how we can improve uh, with accommodation and with the corporates and also bringing service departments to the accommodation co committee because that never happened um, when I first came onto it. And I'm also a non-exec director with uh, the Meetings Industry Association because I think um, I'd like to be able to give something back uh, to the industry. So um, my knowledge of what I've learned along the way, I use in those two committees and then challenge you with as well when it comes to <laughs> service departments. Challenging me and the product team and the rest of the Alta Vita. Yes, I think my name is probably a swear word in the product team someday. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, circling back um, a little bit, Sam, you, you live obviously by examples and um, recently I learned that your daughter has entered into the hospitality industry as well. Yes, <laughs> she has. She, um, she's a little bit obsessed with hotels when she was younger, but then I, she uh, did an apprenticeship in digital marketing and has just joined a hotel chain. So 
I did have to warn her that the name Van Leeuwen might cause her some problems with <laughs> some people within that chain, but um, in a nice way as well. But um, it's nice to see how she's been embraced by the industry because I think mm -hmm. it's a really great industry and hospitality is, is very inclusive and very friendly. And, and um, I think a lot of industries could actually learn from this mm. one, to be honest. And when you started or when you started your um, education, you actually studied hotels and hospitality. Was there any lack of awareness at the time as a career and how has that evolved now? I think the lack of awareness still continues today. Yeah. Um, certainly, I have some cousins who still think I'm a cook because I do <laughs> home economics and uh, they honestly do not still quite understand what I do because of that something. I want to work in hospitality so there was only well, a chef, a cook, a housekeeper uh, and things. And also my daughter, interestingly, when she was in school, she said she wanted to work in hospitality. She had the same challenges. They would say to her, why would you want to work in that industry? Why, mm -hmm. you're smart. Why would you need, why would you do that? So, which really annoyed me, to be honest, because as I said, it's a great industry. Um, the economy is stronger for the hospitality mm -hmm. industry. We bring a lot in, you know, the whole, from apartments, accommodation, meetings and, uh, and events. And part of some of the stuff I try to do with the MIA and GBT is, uh, raise the profile of why people should come into this industry um, and the benefits for it, I think. So I don't think it's evolved yet, but it's slowly getting better, I think. Well, speaking of benefits, um, <clears throat> the next topic that we're going to cover is the benefits of service apartments and hotels. We were discussing quite a lot during our 360, Alto 360 demo earlier around the different prices. <coughs> according to the asset classes. So I um, wanted to get your expertise for the room, Sam, please, regarding the benefits of service apartments since you're one of the early adopters of service apartments. So the reason why we went to service apartments, probably now, easy about 15 years or so ago, 15, 18 years ago, was, um, was the value that they, they brought. And then coupled with that, I think, was the well-being of our travellers. So they suddenly had, instead of being in small hotel rooms, the London, London market, which is our strongest market. Um, sorry, I should probably put it into perspective what PwC is. So PwC, there's about 400,000 people globally. There's about 30,000 people in the UK. So we're quite a big place when it comes to buying accommodation uh, and things like that. So we struggled with actually trying to find availability in hotels, but also good hotels that our people would, um, would like. And that's how I kind of stumbled across service departments. And I think how it's evolved really is you've got so many other areas that underpins, you know, you've got your own space, you've got, there's a big thing now, you're saying with diversity and neurodiversity um, in, the, in the business where people have their own um, alone space, so to speak, if they want to, rather than being in a hotel. Um, so you've got the costs, you've got the security for us um, is we've always banned Airbnb. So no one's ever been allowed to stay in Airbnb because we've not been happy with the security um, along those measures. Whereas that's something that we do see within a service department. And it becomes a home from home for everyone, which mm -hmm. makes our travellers happy. Um, it makes us happy because we have cost savings and also it ticks boxes on our health and safety and our sustainability agendas. Uh, with that. So it's something that we continue to this day drive into mm. PwC. We're going to get to uh, cost savings and anything, any, everything around costing shortly, but you also mentioned sustainability. How is sustainability driving the choices towards service apartments? It's a huge focus for us mm. now. I was actually with our sustainability teams last week to understand what they need me to drive now this coming mm -hmm. year. And we've always focused on air um, and emissions. And we've, we've made huge inroads within PwC by shifting classes on aeroplanes when many people thought a consulting firm would never do that, but we've actually managed to do that. And now it's shifted very much into the hotel and service department sector. So it's having, in an ideal world, I'd love to be able to, um, you see an apartment with the emissions and with everything that relates to sustainability within that apartment, as well as all the other DEI aspects mm -hmm. of it. So things like um, modern slavery. So something that we've developed with um, Alta Vita is that 
every one of our preferred apartments I know has a modern slavery statement. They have all the health and safety being checked under the, the breezeway accreditation. Um, we can see the emissions and such now. We can track the emissions. So it, it's, we want to provide a choice for our travellers um, and our global mobility teams because it's, it's about all areas, not just, just travel. Um, but also we want to be able to, as a as a large corporate, we want to make sure that we're doing the best for the environment as well. So it's very very important, I think, especially this next year now, mm -hmm. and we want to start reporting on it in more detail. On to the next topic around cost savings, Sam. The difference between hotel and service apartments or corporate apartments, and then even deeper with using some of a more creative solution like private living homes, for example. Um, We've shown here, obviously, a good selection of different locations around the world. Um, we added recently Riyadh and Dubai um, due to the market booming at the moment. But th these are just some examples. They may not be 100% accurate, so don't quote us on it uh, yet. But uh, it does show and illustrate that using service apartment can be very cost effective for many travel programs. Maybe you can share some insights. Yes, it's, it's extremely cost effective because um, we don't tend to go into the um, apart hotel uh, area. We tend to sit within service departments uh, because that drives the, uh, the best uh, cost saving for mm -hmm. us. And it allows us to push volume into those um, service departments as well. And it delivers on all areas for our global mobility teams, for our student teams, um, and also for our business travel. There may be different um, rate caps that sit within those, yep. almost, but that's because it's different types of business that we have, uh, which is why it's very important that everyone doesn't just convert to apart hotels because we need that sort of middle of the market uh, business um, for our student business. Um, but it, it, it delivers, it enables our students, our travellers, our, our families to to be in a cost-effective apartment, but still of a quality, yeah. that they're comfortable, that they, they're in the right location in London, because London, or it's not just London, could be the right location anywhere in the world uh, with that, and they feel safe. That's the other key thing for us. Yeah. How do you drive the awareness within PwC for PwC employees to use service apartment asset class versus the hotels that they know well? We've, we've done a lot of work over the years trying to convert people, put a lot of internal marketing, marketing mm -hmm. out there. Um, my colleague Helen, who's here today, does a lot of work with individual travellers. If we spot anyone that um, wants a three nights or more stay, we'll actually contact them and say, no, actually, you should be staying in a service department. Mm -hmm. We will try and switch people into service departments. And with our global mobility teams as well, we look at leveraging um, what they do with what we do with travel and, and our student teams mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to, to, to bring that value, bring that awareness to people. Because once people go into a service department, there's very few people that actually uh, move out of it. Um, and we've become very successful within uh, the UK market for business travel now, bringing people into it. We have a lot of, uh, we have quite an agile mobile workforce. Mm -hmm. So... We often have a lot of people that come down to London for four days a week, um, and they'll stay there every week for, for a couple of months, mm -hmm. um, even. And then one of the things that we often ask for now is having somewhere they can store their luggage or store their toiletries because they're going to come back next week. And that's, that's quite a big part of our business now it's become, because there's more, as many of you will appreciate, there's more a drive to push real estate out from London because it's expensive, so we have more people regionally, so we have more people travelling into the capital um, and into some of the other, Dubai is another example of it uh, as well, really. We have a lot of people going into Dubai that we need to look for cost-effective accommodation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's many locations um, around it, but until you actually sit down with the teams and show them the, the cost-effective way and the benefits that it has, then they don't understand it, but it really, they convert to it very easily. And you mentioned global mobility as the keyword uh, just now, <laughs> which is a perfect segue to our next topic. Um, <clears throat> Sam is, is the, one of the earliest pioneers in designing smart, centralized, managed corporate accommodation program. Um, I guess we already talked about it quite a bit during the first opening panel um, with Sohila and Diogo 
global mobility and business travel consolidation 2.0. I guess we are 0.0, <laughs> Sam, since you, you started this um, movement many years ago already. Can you just walk us through what are the, the secrets, if, if you may, um, to the audience here, and, and how do you centrally consolidate, and, and why actually consolidate, consolidate the span, yeah. not the teams, the span of business mobility, business travel and global mobility? I think data and collaboration is key um, here because once, you, once I started looking into the data, when I introduced service departments to business travel, then I would actually pull the data from our, our accounts payable system. I saw lots of other service departments who were appearing on it, which had, didn't come through the business travel process. Mm -hmm. And then when you start analysing it further, you actually see that they're using the same properties. And it was over a period of time of really bringing all that data together, looking at average rates that we were paying in business mm -hmm. travel, which was a negotiated programme, right. versus in the global mobility programme, which was not negotiated. It was a just a random, anyone goes anywhere. Um, I was able to show the business that actually, if we bring the two areas together, uh, we could benefit from this yep. um, commercially. It wasn't easy because there's a natural... Um, uh, there's a, <laughs> Naturally, people think you're going to take over, and it wasn't about taking over. It's about working collaboratively uh, with the teams. So we brought in the Global Mobility team by saying, well, we're going to use the same suppliers. You keep your same processes. We have our processes, but let's try and streamline a few things that we both benefit. And then we brought in some of our HR teams, so this is our student teams as well, with the exact same thing, saying that you're actually paying more in the same venue. And then we were able to mix the type of classes that we were using because at one point we used a lot of leased properties, service departments and um, uh, co-living um, as well. We were able to actually bring that diversity to the portfolio for the firm, all coming from the data. Then once you start saying to them, if we bring everything in under one process, you still keep your areas, but you come under one process, we can then make that link into Workday, which is our people system. Mm -hmm. We can then make in ensure that all your data goes to international SOS, which was the first um, that we had with Alta Vita. So if anything happens that somewhere in the world, one of our security, global security teams can pull that data. Global Mobility hadn't had that previously. Mm -hmm. They would have to pull up a spreadsheet and then start calling people and things like that, whereas now we've brought that together. So it was just showing the benefits to the team. And once, you, once people get on board and realise you're not taking over their world, you're not taking over what they do, you're actually just going to work in a partnership and work collaboratively, then, then it's much easier mm -hmm. to, to develop. And um, the last two RFPs we've had with um, service departments has been as a team. So we've, they've been stakeholders in the room, they come to all the quarterly meetings, um, we challenge each other because what drives mobility is very different to what drives business travel or projects. And we also bring in meetings and events as well. So we bring every aspect of mm -hmm. it under one area, but ensure that we take on everyone's needs yeah. as well, because I think that's still important for the relocation agents that we use. We make sure they have the data that they need um, to be able to do their job. So when a visa comes through very quickly, we're able to, to jump on that straight away and get it into a service department, whereas they'd have a lot of historically, they'd all be working independently mm -hmm. but as, as one team. It's far, far stronger. When we spoke last week, we discussed a little bit about <clears throat> the challenges of educating corporate housing or service department asset class, particularly in the US, because the US briefs, or Americans, uh, Robert confirmed this is correct or incorrect statement, um, the Americans lives and breathes loyalty program. And then you mentioned something that's very powerful, which is don't let your strategy be driven by your loyalty program. Yes, yes. That is, that is something I push to all our territories, mm -hmm. is by, by opening the doors to loyalty, these loyalty programs and the points and such that come from that actually means you're driving all your business mm -hmm. to one area which takes away pretty much 80% of your negotiation skills because then you have to try and switch it. Um, and that is... One market in particular, because I, whilst I manage the UK inbound and outbound, I also do a consultancy with a lot of our other markets. I say to them, please don't moan to me that you can't get the rate that you want if you're not prepared to switch your strategy. 
Mm. And by switching your strategy, you, do, you have to get out of that loyalty program into somewhere else. So you have to then decide who's in control with it. And it's, it's not going to go away, but I think it's, it's making the right property, the right accommodation for the right purpose. So if it's long stay, it absolutely should be um, service apartment. If you're just going to do one or two nights, go and get your points, mm. go and stay there and get your points, but don't let it dictate your yeah. program. I think. So we're going to get a bit more technical um, with this slide, which I learned a lot uh, through my conversation with Sam last week, that there are multifaceted areas of pricing. It's a very technical hotel procurement um, terminologies, but Sam, maybe you can walk us through what are these rates and what happens if you don't have smart, centralized and managed program? Yeah, the, the, this is something that revenue managers often try and keep to themselves. They don't like to s show that you have different rate categories. And it's also from a corporate point of view, we've evolved over the years, as has the strategy with hotels. Mm -hmm. The strategy with hotels at the moment, for those of you here who manage the business travel, is they want to push you into um, dynamic rates. They want their money. They want their cake and eat it. Um, they want to be able to tell you what rate that you buy at. But where we have what complicates the program and what complicates the procurement of the program, actually, is that you've got all these different rate categories bring different value. So a static rate is your fixed rate that you put in a high volume property mm -hmm. where you negotiate all the additional extras to it. So you have your, your breakfast, your Wi-Fi, your no early checkout fees, all those type of areas. Then you start to move into a dynamic rate, which is where you get a percentage. And that percentage... Um, comes off the best available rate that's in that market. And at the moment, that dynamic rate can go up and down. So Paris Olympics at one point was way up, but now it's way down because mm. they've got no demand. Um, but if you'd bought it in Paris a few months ago, you'd be paying about 200 euros above the average rate they're now selling at. In the leisure world, that's capped. In the corporate world, it's not capped. Um, and that's something I think we need to start seeing within the corporate world. But those properties on chain, on uh, dynamic, tend to be in tertiary, in secondary cities. So where it may be 500 to 1,000 room nights, potentially. Mm -hmm. Then you have, obviously, the chain wide. So if, because we're so big globally, we have a, a rate that goes across a lot of the properties, which is a chain wide rate, which means you have a percentage off the best available rate. We shouldn't be with our size of volume buying the best available rate. We should always be buying that discounted rate. That gives us um, a benefit from that. But then hotels can opt in and opt out. And mm -hmm. again, all this is very confusing on an online tool of what rate are you actually buying at and how you track. And then obviously the final rate is the bar rate. So it's the best available rate. Mm -hmm. um, within, I think, service departments, it's not quite as complicated. Um, although how it feeds into our online tools is quite a challenge for us as corporates because it feeds in so many different ways yeah. and looks all different things because you could have a dynamic rate that has um, doesn't have breakfast, doesn't have you have to pay an early checkout fee, has a different cancellation. Your static rate will have a good cancellation breakfast. So every every one of these rates includes something very different, which makes the, the landscape for hotel purchasing quite complicated. And obviously, with um, corporate management, smart corporate management, this is where we want to be, right? Um, the static negotiated corporate rate based on the volume that yes. you consolidate between. You want the consolidation and you want the volume yeah. where you can. In some markets, you need to probably open up a couple of extra yeah. uh, properties because of you have to manage that demand curve as well because probably 80% of the time you could push it into a few properties, then that other 20% when it's a uh, top market, you need to, to start using other properties as well. So, But it's the static rate is the one that yeah. drives the most value. And we're just going to share uh, that smart centralized management of corporate accommodation can drive up to 28%. These are just some example of the various data that we were able to fetch from Alto Insights, um, where if you were to apply that smart, centralized, managed corporate accommodation, then you can negotiate 
using your purchasing power. And obviously, a few different locations and different lo room types may differ, but on average, you can fetch um, between 20, 20 to 48% of cost savings. Yeah, we've seen considerable cost savings by bringing um, the, the three areas together uh, with yeah. that. And even with um, Global Outbound, actually, where our TMC has not been able to do some project business, we've yeah. switched that across to AltaVita because of the savings driven by um, user service department yeah. of the hotel. You brought up TMC, Sam. I think in, um, during our Alta Search demo session, there, was, there were many passionate questions around using OBT and TMC <coughs> as, as one centralized kind of way in for employees to book. The way we executed um, our collaboration with PwC is quite unique in the way that AltaVita is actually um, quite prominent in your extranet. So perhaps we can um, talk about that briefly and how you decided to, to have a different entry for, just for AltaVita and service apartments. I think for the moment we have an entry that works because we're looking to review our TMC mm -hmm. contracts. Um, and what we have as soon as you go into the OBT, to the online booking tool, it's, um, it says actually if you want to book a service apartment, you click here and it takes you straight to the AltaVita site. So um, it's not hidden behind anything. Um, it's very prominent and it says you know things like if you have project business or you have um, uh, long stay business, then you click straight out into the AltaVita site. Going forward, integration um, is something we would probably look at, mm -hmm. but it's, I'm turning around now thinking where the, the integration is the OBT into Alta, Alta Vita potentially, mm -hmm. who knows, because from the accommodation side, because of the GDSs are so complicated and that data yeah. coming through is so complicated, maybe we switch it on its head. I don't know what the future is. It's something that Olga is on your list now. <laughs> yes. Look out for the next product <laughs> development. <laughs> Yes. With it, but it's, um, and that's been hugely successful. So as yeah. soon as they go into the tool, it goes straight out to them. Yeah. Thank you for saying that, Sam. I think um, it's, it's not a secret anymore that in our near term vision is to be able to consolidate both extended stay and short stay into one AltaVita platform. And yeah, removing GDS entirely from the equation. And actually, just, just thinking about it though as well, so we have multiple entry points mm. as well. So that's one way that the corporate traveler goes into it. Our global mobility goes into the tool a different way, as does our meetings um, team and um, even group accommodation. Yeah. It all goes into the tool a different ways, but it sits very prominently in our, in our internet. So we discussed about the, the why. Now, um, Actually, I forgot about the slide. I'm sorry. I just wanted to revisit back around um, the problem that AltaVita is solving. Um, and I just wanted to gather your thoughts, Sam, on this process, um, because this is what we see quite often. And that's why we are in the business. And that, how yeah. that compares to your experience. So interesting, when I first consolidated GM with business travel, I went direct to the supplier. Um, and that was pre-COVID. It worked really well because it took the whole commission chain mm -hmm. out of it. We just, we just leveraged as we would normally do with um, transient accommodation and went direct to suppliers. COVID has changed the landscape massively when it comes to um, mm -hmm. supply where a lot of, there are not so many um, individuals that have their own properties. They don't have the volume of properties that we used to have. So this is where we went to RFP again last year to relook at the market. But the key for me was to actually get rid of a lot of the middle middlemen yeah. uh, along the way because there's commission stacked on commission stacked on commission and there's a whole load of double dipping in my view. You get the, the agencies make money, the TMCs make money, the, um, and the poor uh, uh, service department provider has to pay that commission and mm -hmm. such out, whereas I'd rather it come straight to us as a corporate. Obviously, there's, there's going to be one layer of middleman from... from uh, putting the bookings through and such. Which adds but, values. Which adds a huge <laughs> amount of value because it's, it's the centralised, mm -hmm. consolidated route. But going this way is costs money and it's also very confusing for the mm. booker because they in, in, in PwC there is only one way to book an apartment yeah. and, and that's the way forward. Whereas having all these different routes, um, you'd say, oh, am I doing a global mobility booking today? Am I doing a project? Am I doing it? Which way do I go if I'm actually, whether we have one route in now that does everything. And for me, it's also about being transparent. 
It has to be win-win for everybody. So that goes down to, for PwC to AltaVita, down to the supplier as well in our supply chain. Um, you know, we drive about costs, but we want to make sure that you're a profitable business as well. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so now we're moving on to the how. Um, the te technicalities and the nitty gritty of how to actually start consolidation, um, initiating RFP and so on. Sam? Yeah, I think this goes back into kind of what we were saying yeah. previously, which was um, just bringing all the departments together and looking at the data and seeing what actually what, what everybody's done or everybody does and then educating people as well. So we have procurement. I've had a leg in procurement and operations for many years and it's still pencils with pencils. You know, mm -hmm. you have to educate. How do you buy accommodation with procurement? It's very different. You have to bring in the, in the, um, the experts in global mobility to understand how do you want to buy? How do you want to bring things together? And then also the nuances that hit around business travel as well. So once you bring all those specialists together, then it's about writing the RFP that suits um, all the various stakeholders. Because I think that's really important to get traction. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you won't get buy-in from the business. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Then you have to sell it to the business. <laughs> then you have to go to the leadership board and say, this is what my proposal is. Or this is what I think we should be doing. Okay, um, moving on to the next topic, which is how Altavita has collaborated with PwC. It looks like a super complex integration diagram, but this is um, Sam's vision and brain put in one slide. <laughs> so um, maybe we can start with the left two. First. The eyes in the back of my head are not working <laughs> so well at the moment, and so I'll, I'll try and see if I can do from the... Uh, from the, yeah, the, the so uh, maybe I can support with this one. So essentially, the, the blue blocks are all the areas of the businesses within PwC that Sam has consolidated from a spend perspective, but not from a collaboration or function perspective. Um, what we've done here is to enable single sign-on um, for PwC employees. So we know when there's a new employee, um, it automatically it comes to our the work data, day exactly, yeah. which is uh, powered by integration with Workday, um, the HRIS, and also um, an integration with an RMC platform or a moving uh, platform, which is streamlining the relocation workflow. And then the middle part is how the employees and mobility managers, um, travel managers, are accessing the AltaVita platform. And of course, um, you know, you, you're now well aware and very well versed of the AltaVita technology. You can access Alto Curate, Alto Search, um, be it for individual or group booking. And I think it's very important to say at this point, actually. So one of our um, logos within PwC is uh, human-led tech enabled. Mm. The human part is still really critical to this process. We've got the tech that supports it and enables it, but the human part to answer those challenges and issues and look, the visas come through quick, you need to get an apartment, um, is, is really still very important. And one of the things we also introduced actually at this phase was um, a WhatsApp group that people could actually just WhatsApp yeah. because youngsters don't talk anymore. I know my children, they don't, they're <laughs> 21 and 24. They don't talk, they WhatsApp, they send messages and it's been hugely successful. But um, the, at the end of the line, there's always someone who will pick up their call. That's always been yeah. quite important with the technology. Yeah, 100%. Um, in it, the high touch, high service delivery is super key when it comes to uh, Fortune 500 companies like PwC. And so um, the end part of the diagram is really all about the reporting. So Alto Insights, as you know, so travel risk management is from our uh, interna international SOS integration. And of course, Alto One as well. Um, and let's not forget about EcoStats and the reporting element of EcoStats. Yes, that's all very um, important to various people in the business. So everyone has input into this. So Globe Mobility so they see their own reporting. They can measure how they're performing. Our sustainability people see it. Procurement people see it. So it's, um, again, it's kind of all singing, all dancing, uh, really, that gives everyone that tick in the box that says, yes, this is a su successful program, which is why I was quite challenged on your Alto 360, because that brings in another dimension to yeah. the, the cost saving side of it. Okay, finally, just kind of um, a brief illustration of, of how 
expedient we were able to execute this together. So I, I did mention that we met um, in January 2018, but the work actually only started in July when we won the PwC RFP. So it hasn't been a, a whole year yet, but we no. managed to achieve all of this together. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's right. And, and I'll be open and honest with, with everyone here as well, is that Alta Vita were completely out of the game. They were not someone we were even going to entertain with it because there wasn't enough known about Alta Vita. Um, and Helen and I thought, mm, we'll just have a conversation, see what's going on uh, and things like that. And then we had a conversation and thought, no, actually, they can bring a, quite a few things to the market. And it's been a bit of a game changer because if I was a betting person, I probably would not have bet on Alta Vita doing that because it was so... Um, inexperienced in some areas, but once you drill down into it, highly experienced also. And um, I put Vivian Carolina, I think a few times, I had made a phone call, said, I need to have a, a frank conversation with you. Can you actually do this? Just tell me straight, can you do this or not? Because I'm putting my neck out. The RFP <laughs> scoring has come in. Can you do this? And I've been so impressed with the agility and the flexibility of where we've got to. We awarded the contract end of July, started writing the contract in August, and we were live then by September. Mm -hmm. A lot of very late nights, a lot of very sleepless nights, but we got there and we turned around a huge amount of business within a short space of time. Um, and it was largely because our incumbent supplier wasn't particularly performing. We needed to, to get traction on this. And we had a lot of other suppliers who were very cynical in the marketplace that Alta Vita could do it. That's the worst thing to say to me because I'm just going to prove them wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the same way. Yeah, totally I totally have, same I think, totally have proved them wrong because <laughs> all the challenges and things I've thrown, thrown at Alta Vita, you've actually managed to do. And I, those who know me, I, I don't mess around. I'll tell you exactly what it is with such, which is why I wanted uh, Vivian Caroline to be very honest with me of whether this could work or not. And uh, to be able to deliver something this quickly and we're just going to come to our annual report, our, our annual review, literally the week after next, um, to see how we're performing with a new supplier within such a short space of time is unheard of for PwC. Even our own tech people were surprised how quick we got this in place. So, yeah, testament to you with your agility and things on it. And we have a really good program. And it's, ironically, it started off as a UK program. Our first inquiry was for six people for six months in, Austra in Sydney. Yeah. So... Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's the end of the fireside chat. Um, I guess we can maybe afford one question, if anyone would like to ask Sam any questions. No? All clear? You should say that was too honest, <laughs> isn't it? You don't answer the question. Okay, one time. question. <laughs> From I think it was out of necessity. We had to, it was phased. But we, it was out of necessity. So we had a transition phase where we let the incumbent supplier keep a cup of extension bookings for a couple of months. But um, to be honest, it went to a phone system immediately because we had to build Altiverse. But then the basic part of Altiverse had kicked in within like one or two months. Uh, with it. And yeah, I, I don't know. The, the team have responded amazingly well to it. And then we had a lot of sleepless nights <laughs> with our team uh, internally. But um, it's achievable and it does work. That, that, that is the main thing. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> if you have more time, that would be better. But we just had no choice, unfortunately. Because, sorry, September for us is one of our busiest periods. That's when all we have probably about f four... 400 students that need accommodation from September. So we have to, we have to get that right very quickly. All right, beautiful. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. <laughs>